Before we begin, I want to thank the planning committee. These are the people who really make the summit possible. Evelyn Lundberg Stratton, retired justice of the Supreme Court of Ohio, currently of counsel at Voorhees. Thank you, Eve. Michael Jackson, retired judge of the Cuyahoga Court of Common Pleas General Division and a judge of one of Ohio's veterans treatment dockets. A man always endeavoring to further the cause and welfare of veterans and service members every day. Danny Eakins of the Ohio Department of Veterans Services, Tammy Puff, the office of the governor of Mike DeWine, Melissa Knopp, formerly of Stepping Up Ohio and now currently the executive director of the Ohio Criminal Sentencing Commission. And from the United States Veterans Administrations, Jim Kennelly and Teresa Sickman. And thank you. Lieutenant Joseph Swati of the Ohio National Guard for joining our committee, and Kelly Firesheets of Cordata Health, and Kathleen Gallant of Mighty Crow, and my administrative assistant of the Supreme Court of Ohio, Elisa Guthrie, who helped keep us all in line on those calls. <clears throat> I also want to thank our generous sponsors, without whose support we would be unable to host this event the Office of the Ohio Attorney General, Dave Yost, the Office of Criminal Justice Services of Ohio, the Ohio State Bar Association, Cordata Health, and another thank you to Judge Jackson for his work in securing funding from the National Institute of Corrections, which is part of the Department of Justice. Today we devote our time and learning discussing intercept zero, intercept one. In my view, the adoption of programming that makes intercept zero and intercept one a reality in Ohio is the true ultimate goal of the Lean Forward Initiative. May a veteran or service member never enter my system. May they always be treated by the wraparound community that they live work and have protected throughout their careers. Community services and treatment reach America's heroes before they enter the criminal justice system. And if a service member or veteran does have contact with a law enforcement officer or emergency services, that he or she is deflected away from the system when it is possible to receive treatment. If you think about it, when people move through the criminal justice system, they move through that system in predictable ways. But what if they didn't? So today, I ask you to think about how your organization can join that question of how do we deflect service members or veterans from the criminal justice system. Think about the decision points of your organization or your work as you work within the continuum of the criminal justice system? Where do you and your organization sit on the continuum of the criminal justice system? And if you're well within it, how can you improve or reach beyond it at the beginning of that continuum to impact something differently? What are the key decision points that you can impact within and without? When can you and your organization deliver services at the lowest level of possible engagement with the criminal justice system? For intercept zero, what does the veteran and his or her family need first? How can we identify those potential needs and anticipate the challenges they face in acquiring those needs? What engagement does the veteran or service member, his or her family need that does not require a law enforcement intervention? How can we shape the thinking of our organizations so that service members and veterans see treatment as a strength, not a weakness, certainly stigma-free? where they're able to ask for help without being judged or condemned or feeling as if they will suffer a loss of identity, of honor, 
because they're reaching their hand out for help. And if a service member or veteran unfortunately does engage law enforcement in a call for service in a moment of crisis, what initiatives and treatment programs are accessible before those charges are filed? How can we deflect them where appropriate within that system of those decision makers in order to ensure treatment instead of a jail cell? Deflecting veterans from the criminal justice system begins with the community, the host of treatment providers available, and it includes every partner within our criminal justice system who believe and answer the call of the need of a service member and veteran with I am here to help. As I said a moment before, this is the goal of the Lean Forward initiative so that all service members and veterans come wholly home without ever touching the judicial system. I hope you not only enjoy today's summit, but that you learn something today that you can immediately apply to help Ohio service members and veterans so that our state, the great state of Ohio, is the first state to create a wraparound community where no service member or veteran ever enters the criminal justice system. What can you and your organization do to foster Ohio in intercept zero, intercept one. May God bless all of you. Keep the faith. It's a little before time and I like being early as the Attorney General knows, but I see Attorney General Dave Yost here who is a good, great man and a good friend to me. And I am thrilled to introduce Attorney General Dave Yost, who has been a gracious and enthusiastic champion of Ohio's veterans. Last year, Dave was elected to a second term as Attorney General. A.G. Yost graduated from The Ohio State University and received a JD from Capital Law. He began his career as a reporter before going on to serve as Delaware County's auditor and then prosecutor. As Attorney General, he has initiated and supported the Law Enforcement Liaison Program in helping deflect service members and veterans from the criminal justice system. Attorney General Yost. Thank you, Madam Justice. Uh, may it please court. That was supposed to be a joke. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I practice in front of judges uh, advocating for the state, so I'm not allowed to have friends that are judges. But if I did, one of them would be certainly Sharon Kennedy. She came to my office uh, right after I was elected Attorney General. Uh, and wanted to talk about veterans' issues. Um, this was long before she was Chief Justice, uh, and it was something that was on her heart, on her mind, on her conscience, uh, and she ignited a flame in me uh, that changed my trajectory as Attorney General. Uh, look, listen, I appreciate all of you being here today. Uh, Justice Stratton, it's good to see you as always. Thank you for your leadership on, long leadership on this important issue. Uh, and I know we're here to talk about veterans who have had some kind of difficulty returning to civilian life after service. Um, but before we turn to that, I'd like to broaden our perspective for just a moment. Uh, I think there's some stereotypes out there uh, that are really not very true. Uh, on the data, yeah, the, the stereotype of the uh, Hollywood stereotype of the uh, veteran who's a ticking time bomb, or the, the story of the veteran who is self-medicating with alcohol and has multiple arrests, uh, and that sort of thing. The, you know, the homeless guy who claims at least to be a veteran at the uh, intersection of the freeway ramp. Uh, all of those problems are real, and we will be talking about them today and many days in the future, working to
to address the needs that they represent. But we forget that a majority of our veterans make a successful return back to civilian life, and they continue making the same kinds of significant contributions in civilian life that they made in uniform. There's 330 million Americans, give or take a few, uh, and just 1.3 million of those are in active service. Uh, that's one in 250 or so. Uh, each of those folks has a sense of mission that impels them to volunteer and to defend the rest of us. Each of these has made a promise to put, at some point in their life, they, to put their life on the line so that we civilians would not have to. And they're doing this during the prime years of their lives. While the rest of us are pursuing education and training uh, and building our careers, uh, these folks, our veterans, are devoting themselves to protecting our society and protecting us so that we can do those things in peace and security. When they come home, complete their service, they continue to give to their country. According to the Small Business Administration, uh, almost a tenth of American businesses are owned by veterans. They represent one in 250 of the population, one in 10 businesses. That is impressive. These companies generate a trillion dollars in revenue and employ about five million people. I'm pleased to say that in the Attorney General's office, we currently have 51 staffers who have served in the military, uh, and now they continue their public service in state government. All around us, veterans are raising families and strengthening our communities and our society. They're not the problem in our society. They are priceless assets. So whatever time and money and effort that we put in to helping them, the one, the small number that have trouble re-entering civilian society, it's a drop in the bucket. It's money well spent. It is a duty of honor. With that context in mind, let's talk about veterans who need help. There are reasons that they're struggling. Many of them have wounds that we can see. Many of them have wounds that we cannot see. They've gone to places that we would never choose to visit. They have seen things that we could not bear to see. They've endured terrors that we cannot imagine and live with memories that give them no rest. They have these unseen wounds, the damage to their bodies we can sometimes repair to some degree, the damage to the soul and the mind and the spirit is much more difficult. And it's these struggles that confront our law enforcement officers, our courts, our social service partners. The good news is we've come a long, long way in learning about trauma and learning about stress and how to deal with it. That hasn't always been the case. Audie Murphy, the soldier who won the most medals in honor in World War II, uh, went on to become, of course, famous action hero, uh, an action star in Hollywood movies. Uh, he said, this is the way American soldiers were treated. After the war, they took army dogs and rehabilitated them for civilian lives. But they turned soldiers into civilians immediately and let them sink or swim. Today, we're more aware of the struggles of veterans to face, and we do devote more resources than we did uh, back in Audie Murphy's day. Veterans Courts, championed by Justice Stratton, uh, it, it, it is, uh, are a huge advance uh, and something that we hadn't done for a long time even when we had specialty dockets for drug addicts, uh, we didn't immediately see the usefulness of the same kind of idea for veterans. 
But when we look at the numbers of tre tr uh, troubled veterans who succumb to substance abuse, suffer mental illness, repeated cycles through the justice system, we still have a long way to go. It starts with some more veterans courts, and I'm pleased to see them expanding every year. But we need to do more. We've got to reduce the harm on the front end, not just because our troubled veterans deserve it, but because our nation actually depends on it. George Washington, a veteran, said this, the willingness with which our young people are likely to serve in any war, and folks, we have not done away with war, shall be directly proportional to how they perceive the veterans of earlier wars were treated and appreciated by their nation. Last December, I was elected the president of the National Association of Attorneys General for 2023. It is the custom of the, that organization that the president select an initiative, uh, something that they will focus for their year in office on and promote. The aim is to put that issue on the radar of every attorney general in the country, stimulate discussion, develop best practices, and to coordinate action. I decided to make veterans my initiative. And as we come to the end of this year, we have spent a great deal of time and been uh, around the country uh, promoting veterans and the many excellent programs that are being developed at a local level. One of the things I'm sharing with my colleagues across the country is veterans outreach uh, programs that we're expanding uh, here in Ohio. Later this morning, you'll hear details about this program from Carrie Bartunek, the Director of Executive Affairs in my office. Um, and uh, I'm very pleased, I saw earlier Dave Corlett, a uh, sergeant from Cincinnati, a veteran, uh, who was one of the first people that I saw doing what I'm about to describe. Dave, it's great to see you here again today. One of the key features of the program is in, in, in enlisting the help of police officers who themselves are military veterans. Their military status, which, and we are developing ways to, for that to be obvious on the street, uh, signals to a troubled veteran that there's someone who knows where they're coming from. When you uh, have been in battle, I am told, I have not been in any battle more difficult than a political fight, the, you, you quickly learn to distrust everyone except the people that are with you in your unit, the people that fight alongside you. That trust and distrust carries on into civilian life for some veterans and the idea that you can see a badge, a decoration on the uniform of a law officer that says, I was there, changes the interaction in a heartbeat. That officer turns from being a threat, someone who is not uh, to be trusted, who's part of that huge sphere of distrust, into a comrade in arms, a brother or sister in arms. We're really gratified by the space that we've received, uh, or the, the response we've received so far. I want to thank all the local law enforcement agencies that have embraced this program. If it sounds like something that your agency would be interested in, uh, Carrie is here. Carrie waved to everybody. She wants to tell you everything you could ever want to know uh, about it and, and wants to help you with resources, information, and networking. Uh, finally, I want to thank all of you today who are, here are attending. I'm gonna leave you with a quote from one more great president, Abraham Lincoln, to those of you who are leading this mission. He said, honor the soldier and the sailor everywhere who bravely bears his country's cause. Honor also to the citizen who cares for his brother in the field and serves as best he can the same cause. Ladies and gentlemen, 
President Lincoln was talking about all of you. Thank you for your work. Thank you for being here today. shorter than him. <laughs> so thank you all for coming to this event. We're very excited and we do have a fairly large group uh, on the uh, uh, internet or watching by virtual, uh, some 60 or more. So we are very pleased for that uh, group as well. Uh, I wanted to just give you a little background of how we got here. So years and years, well, my father, first of all, was in World War II. He was a bomb demolition expert. I lost my grandfather uh, in, in the Merchant Marines in World War II, and I have five uncles, and my two brothers uh, served in the Vietnam theater, although not actually in Vietnam. And so I have a long military background, but I was really working on mental health courts when I first talked to a gentleman from the VA when I was giving a speech in D.C., who said they wanted to start veterans courts, and I knew there was a ben benefits appeals court, and when I asked him what it was, and he described it, I said, well, that's a mental health or a drug court, but with a vet in it. Why don't you use our model? So we had a conference in D.C. with the big wigs to try to sell them on the idea, and then I was appointed to a committee at the VA to put together the Veterans Justice Outreach Program, which many of you are familiar with, and is one of their most successful programs. And that really kick-started my involvement in the veterans area. So I learned that there's so many departments that did something. Mental health did something. At that time, drug and alcohol was separate, did something, et cetera, et cetera. And so I put together the first conference when I was a justice, just sort of connecting the dots, having every one of those groups share what they did, trying to make connections. So I did four of those while I was at the court. And then I left uh, 12 years early to really because I wanted to focus on mental health and criminal justice. And I had read Five Feet of Reese for 16 years and there were a lot of people that wanted my job, but not many people really wanted to champion mental health in those days because it wasn't quite as uh, accepted and to talk about as in these days. And so uh, I interested Kennedy. Many of you know uh, Chief Justice was a police officer before she became a judge. And we are great friends, and uh, so I was talking about veterans, and she got the passion for it, and she ran with it, and she left me in the dust. She's done amazing things with uh, visiting courts and promoting veterans courts to start start veterans courts, et cetera. And then we had the idea when we heard about Sergeant Corlett's project, we went to the AG and asked him to think about this military resource, and he ran with it. And so it's just kind of grown and grown and grown. And so we are now on our fifth joint one where she and I've worked together, our ninth overall. And it's, uh, we just keep looking for new themes. And this year we decided, you know, let's move up the chain and let's talk about how we can keep veterans from entering the criminal justice system. Because we've done a lot on criminal justice system itself and all the resources. So that's kind of how we got here. Uh, but it's so exciting. There's so many people in this room that I've partnered with over the many years. It's uh, exciting to see all of you. Some of you I may not recognize because I talked to you on the phone for like, or on video chat or whatever for the last five years and haven't seen you in person. So it's nice that we are back in person again. And I'm very appreciative. <laughs> 